Okay, we're on page 99. Yesterday, we just finished the first blessing of the, of the Shemun Esrei. Now, I want to point out something in the grammar. Let's see if they get this right. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> because it's going to be parallel to something in the second blessing. So I mentioned this to you in general, but I didn't mention it to you in the context of this particular blessing. Blessed are you, you, Hashem our God, God of our forefathers, and there's a long, a long text at the bottom of the paragraph before the gray. It says, "Brings a redeemer to their children, uh, children's children, for his name's sake." You ought to be surprised by that. Because the paragraph starts by addressing God as you. At this point, it addresses God as he. That's right. We said that yesterday. That in rabbinic liturgy, that it's, it's a standard feature of, uh, of, of, of style. Now, all of the material in between is ambiguous. Every phrase in between could be read as you or he. Uh, the Supreme God. You are the Supreme God, or He is the Supreme God. Bestows beneficial kindnesses. You bestend, bestow, or He bestows. All of them in the Hebrew are ambiguous. So you could raise the question where is the shift intended to be? And it's not exactly obvious. But one thing's for sure it's explicit in for His name's sake. So We'll have to think about that, and we'll have to uh, have that in mind, because in the second blessing, exactly the same thing happens again. Okay, now, um, the next blessing's title in English is God's Might, in the Hebrew is Gvuros, and Gvura is associated with strict justice, which, as I told you yesterday, <coughs> there's, we talked about what, the purpose for creation, um, so the idea here is that even though the purpose of creation is all loving kindness, we spoke about that yesterday, but sometimes loving kindness is open and obvious when it occurs, and sometimes it isn't. And that's why in the first blessing we talk about good loving kindnesses, and we're not uh, worried that it might be redundant, because the good refers to the fact that they are Good when they first appear. You can see yourself that they are good. That's tov. Whereas when it's uh, guros, which are applications of justice, that's what's called litov. It's something which is for good, brings to good, a means to good, but in fact is not good itself. If you're worried about the idea that God brings about things that are not good, so I have recorded that many times. You can look it up on so any time, other places. Yes, it is true that God does things that are not good. He does them for good. So, um, this blessing, which is titled Guru, starts, You are mighty, and they translate here, my Lord, with a capital L, because this is the name of God, which is spelled with an Aleph Dalet, not with a Yud and a He and a Vav and a He. And it's good that in this case they, they give it a different English translation. Um, they translate reviver of the dead. Are you with abundant power to save? Reviver of the dead refers to what we call Trias Mason. That is to say, when after at a certain point in the future, after the Mashiach comes, there will be a uh, coming back to life of those who have died. Um, it's not obvious that that's what this, this phrase means. And one problem with it is this. If we, skip, we just sk uh, skim over the text of the blessing, you'll see that it occurs over and over again. Is this the next page? Yeah. Um, the second line on page 100. Um, well, how do they do it here, over here? who sustains the living with kindness and 
revivifies the dead, that's two, with abundant mercy, suppresses the, suppresses the fallen, heals the sick, releases the bound, and maintains his faith with those asleep in the dust. I suppose that's also reviving the dead, that's with his faith with those who sleep in the dust, that's three. Who is like you, master of mighty deeds, and comparable to you, O king, who causes death and restores life, that's four, makes salvation sprout. And you are faithful to vivify the dead, that's five. And then the closing is, blessed be Hashem, who revivifies the dead, which is six or five, because the closing should be five times one blessing is really, I think, a, a, a winning score. Our use of Hebrew, the classical use of Hebrew, is extremely um, uh, brief, truncated, um, full of uh, uh, the suppression of things that you would like to know. Great stories like uh, the sacrifice of Isaac uh, told in 30 sentences. You could write 60 pages on that story. So when you know that you have a style of writing that is extremely concentrated and extremely brief, and you have in a short paragraph the same thing five times, it catches your attention. You know, something, something special is going on here. And something that's special has to be understood in so special way. Yehudah Ham which is a very early sefer from, and from the medieval period devoted to explaining the text of prayer, has a different idea here. He says there's only one phrase that specifically refers to the future revival of the dead, and that's he keeps his faith with those who sleep in the dust. That one's hard to avoid. Those who sleep in the dust, those who have died already, and he keeps his faith with them, it means we're going to bring them back to life. The others, he says, are, are indications of the fact that, uh, I'll give you this a, modern, a modern analogy. You know, we're like, like a vacuum cleaner. You've got to plug it into the wall because that's where the electricity comes from. Detached from the wall, it doesn't do anything. We are not self-sufficient. We don't have our lives in our pockets. We're not in charge of what makes us alive. And there's a certain divine energy which is giving us life continuously. And also there are, in, there are elements in the environment which are designed to produce life. And then we take this phrase in the Hebrew, literally, it literally means causes the dead to live. And the implication is that if you look at a human being isolated, that's like an unplugged vacuum cleaner. An unplugged vacuum cleaner won't do anything. Even if you flip the switch, it won't do anything. So a, true, a human being also who's unplugged from the life-giving features of the world, including direct divine energy, is dead. We have to think of ourselves as essentially, inherently dead, receiving life all the time. Now, I don't know if you're into the studies of fine-tuning, which have been carried out by physicists and biologists and astronomers, but there are many features of the universe and many features of the planet without which life or, in, or intelligent life could develop and, and, uh, and, um, and exist. Of course, develop means you believe in their story, which we don't believe in, but the, the requirements are uh, many and some of them are very mysterious. Um, we all obviously depend upon liquid water. Um, the last time I looked, there was a research paper which said there are 20 features of liquid water that are not currently understood, not currently explained. The chemistry of water doesn't explain them. That is to say, we don't know the chemistry well, well enough, probably, but we don't have the current explanation. One little thing is, you know, when you cool things down, they contract. When you heat them up, they expand. You're familiar with that. Uh, what temperature would you expect liquid water is at its uh, most contracted? Zero. Most contracted, <laughs> zero, right? Just before it turns into ice. But that's not the fact. The fact is that it's most contracted at 4 degrees centigrade. And as you continue to cool it, it expands. Hmm, that's a little weird. Why would it do that? Well, you see, if you have a liquid and some parts are 
more dense, in some parts are less dense, the less dense parts are going to go to the top. And now they're four degrees, so they're not freezing. So they protect the water below from freezing because they protect it from the cold air that's above, which is at zero degrees Fahrenheit. And that's one of the reasons why you only get a thin film of ice on the top and the rest doesn't freeze. Also, when it goes down from four to zero, it expands. When it, re when it becomes ice, it expands. So then it bells up, since liquids are almost in incompressible. It bells up and there's, a and there's a packed pocket of air underneath. And that's why lakes and streams don't freeze solid in the wintertime. And that's pretty convenient, because if you're a fish, you're not going to live if it's frozen solid. And most of the vegetation won't live if it's frozen solid. It'll be one winter, and when you wake up in the next spring, it'll all be gone. So that's one little tiny feature of how the world is designed, which enables, enables us to survive. So these, this repetition of the Chaya Mesim is, is to invite you to meditate on all the features of the world that make life possible or sustain life. Uh, <clears throat> we have a lot of press about all the dangers uh, that the planet is in enduring, and there's a lot of uh, talk about the fact that it's human beings' activities that are destroying the planet and putting us all in danger, and uh, I'm not commenting on how much of it is true and how much of it is hype and so forth and so on, but we must, should reflect that since we seem to have the capability of doing that, it could have worked out that we did it and all died before we discovered what was going on, couldn't it? So it seems like there's something making sure that, okay, maybe we're doing things wrong, but we find out early enough and then we correct it. That's also a feature of you know, maintaining life. So uh, although the translators here translated as the the reviving of the dead, which will take place in the future, I think that a, a, a correct and more immediate, fruitful understanding of it is to meditate on the various features of the world by which we manage to survive. Yeah. Constant, like, like as, you, as if we have certain death coming back to life every day. You know. Oh yes, I mean uh, the Talmud says that sleep is one sixtieth of death. Anybody know where the fraction one sixtieth comes from? Why would that be a fraction that's important for us? Okay, so when you have a mixture of food, let's say, and one part is kosher, one part is treif. If you have 60 parts kosher to one part treif, total of 61 parts, that usually means that the treif part no longer plays a role and you can eat all 61. Some say the treif is converted into kosher. Some say it just doesn't have an influence on determining the character of the mixture. But everybody agrees you can eat, you can eat, the, whole, you can eat the whole thing. Any less, and it destroys the mixture. So one part in 60 would destroy the mixture. It means one part in 60 is the smallest presentation possible that doesn't disappear. Because we're one in 61, it would disappear. So when you say that sleep is one sixtieth of death, what you mean is it's got something in common with death, but the amount that it has in common is so small that if it were any smaller, it would disappear entirely. So it's the smallest possible amount in common with death that still has a, 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 an identity. Um, and then waking up in the morning is a kind of revivica revivification. Of course, it, it's a miniature, but one has to appreciate that the, the process is like, how shall I say? Um, you know, it's like vicarious experience. You, you meet people who've had certain experiences and you, and you think about people who've had certain experiences and you think, boy, having that experience could be very valuable. 
could change your life. Or let's suppose you're going to be a psychologist or even, let's say, a surgeon, and you're going to treat people, and you think, if I had experiences similar to theirs, I'd be much more sensitive to them. Now, let's suppose you're a psychologist who treats addiction. Hmm. You don't want to become an addict so you can experience it for yourself and then be more sensitive to other addicts. I don't think that's the route to go. We have a substitute. We have literature and other artistic expression, film, where you can have those experiences vicariously, not as intense, obviously, not as powerful, but still similar, so that you can say, aha, that's what it's like to be an addict, and thereby be more sensitive to, to, uh, to people of that kind. So here, here also, you, know, you have the experience of, of, of sleep, where you have no control. You're not aware of what's going on around you. You can be taken advantage of because you have no advantage, uh, awareness of what's going on around you. When you wake up, you have to be filled in what happened in the last seven hours. Um, that's to give us just a little bit of a, of a taste of, uh, of what death is like. And then restoring the soul is like, like a revivification. So I, think that's, I think that's right. Is that right? The other things also are like 160. Yeah. Can you go back a little bit to the, the part that said Yes. Would, at, at first glance, it looks like he would do, do all of these things for our sake. I mean, he, he does a lot of good things, and I, think, I would think that he would be doing all of these for us. Yes, but there's a, there's a variety of ways of doing things for us. Um, I don't know if you've heard the expression, maybe it's already co-signed to, to history, but there was an expression, Bleeding heart liberal. We can look it up on Wikipedia. They have it. Um, it meant that a person who's moved by his emotion of sympathy above and beyond what logic would require him to do. So is, it, is he doing it for him? Sure, he's doing it for him. He's doing it for him so much that he's doing it out of control, without any logical, without any logical plan without any logical uh, con uh, constraint. He's certainly doing it for him, but it's not the best thing to do for him. Right? So um, people who have training in this, and people who, through life experience, want to really benefit other people, think twice, and they use what they know about the world to channel their feelings of sympathy into actions which will really be beneficial to the, to the person that you're dealing with. So it's not, it's not enough to say he's doing it for. How is he doing it for? What particular elements of his, of his personality, character, motivation are operative in his doing it for? Um, and that's what I think Iman Shmo means, because Baruch has his own plan of how to do it for. And he's following that plan. It's a global plan. It takes into account the past, present, and future. Right? It's, uh, it gives it a much more, gives a much uh, bigger um, context to the decision that he's making. Uh, if you didn't have that context in mind, then you could misinterpret what was happening and not appreciate it. I'll give you just one little example of this. People worried about certain types of lives. Let's say this person was born as a Jew, but he never heard anything about Judaism. Lived his whole life that way. And he died. What's the use of a life like that? What does God get out of a life like that? Why does God create him? Why does God bother investing in him? Now, you find that about reincarnation, and you say, um, imagine a biography that has 10 chapters. This guy lived to 100. Each, each chapter is devoted to a decade of his life. And you read chapter 6 only. How much would you expect to understand out of chapter 6 only? Well, gee, you know, I don't know where he's coming from. I don't know where he's going. I wouldn't understand a lot. And if I'm smart, I wouldn't draw any conclusions about the significance of his life just from chapter 6. Now I tell you, what you see from birth to death is only one chapter. Because Baruch dealt with this person, birth to death, as one chapter out of a multi-chapter history. When you hear that, you think, well, then 
maybe I shouldn't draw any conclusions because I don't know the other chapters. And that's right. You shouldn't draw any other conclusions. So this is a reminder that he has his plan from his point of view seeing all of the relevant, all of the material entirely and certainly all the relevant material. And we don't see that. That being the case, we should reserve judgment. Whereas people will say, oh, if I cared about him, I would never do that. So how could God do that? The answer is he cares about him in a way that you can't appreciate because you don't know the rest of the story. His name is the projection of his vision, projection of his plan, projection of his modus operandi, the way, he, the way he's dealing with things. And that's from his point of view of overseeing everything. It's from his view down. And we're reminded that we don't, have, we don't, we don't share that view. So, and we know that he's doing that. You know, it's sort of like a person who's never seen or heard of surgery. And you tell, and you tell them, for this, you need to be cut with a knife. He's not going to like that. Listen, you know, I used to use this as, an, as, a, as, a, as a parable. I mean, you've heard of Albert Schweitzer? You can look him up also. He was a, an American who was an organist and a, and a doctor and a very highly cultured man. And he went to Africa to, to uh, practice medicine among the natives. And it was a great, they thought, was thought of as a very saintly thing to do. Now, I'm making up a parable. He comes to the natives, they don't know who he is, don't know what he's doing, but when they have a broken bone, when he treats it, it gets better. And when they have a, an infection, he treats it, and it gets better. And uh, when they have a pulled muscle, and he treats it, and it gets better. And they, they really appreciate it. He obviously knows a lot of things that they don't know. After he's there for two years, a guy comes in with um, a certain problem with his foot, and Schweitzer says, sorry, we have to cut off your foot. Okay, here's the parting of the ways. Some people say, cut off my foot, but up until now, for two years, you've been curing us, rendering us whole and functional, restoring our health. Now you want to cut off my foot? You've got to be crazy. You've gone insane. Something's wrong with you. You don't like me. You must hate me. We're going to cut off my foot? Other people will say, look, he's been here for two years. Obviously, he can make a much better living in New York. <laughs> I've been kind and generous and very helpful in ways that we can't explain. If he says you have to cut off the foot, could be that you have to cut off the foot because that's the best he can do. Could be, right? That's not a crazy thought, is it? Isn't it something which could be natural? You could think the rational thing to do after two years of experience to trust him when he tells you to do something which is painful and destructive, that there's nothing better to do. But in order to do that, you have to appreciate he sees things that I don't see. He knows things that I don't know. And from his point of view, of which I'm ignorant, this is the best thing that could happen. That's the kind of lesson that we're getting here. He's doing this for the sake of his name, which we don't appreciate. We appreciate that there's a certain motivation, but we don't see how the motivation operates in many cases. If I know that he has a plan from his point of view whose purpose is the, whose purpose is the, uh, uh, the reduction of, of loving kindness, then I can, then I can trust. But I have to remind, be reminded of that. So I should have done this before. I always forget to do this. Where am I up to? 150. I have to calibrate my instant pump sensor. Why the, those words are superior to the words that are on the on the page? I mean, you could say it other ways, but that that's not usually uh, that's almost always the case. That this, the way something is said isn't the only possible way to say it. I don't see why it would be any better than this. Okay. So now um, remember now that this is might, which we we translated as 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 strict judgment. And let's see how the, how, the, how the text goes. So first of all, it talks about keeping the dead alive, when that's, and that's us. That sounds pretty good. Um, abundant power to save. 
That's one reasonable translation. Could mean saves much, but okay. Um, we'll skip the, uh, the thing about the weather. Sustains the living with kindness and makes the dead live with abundant mercy. This is, this is kindness, which in the Hebrew is chesed, and mercy. That sounds like the first bracha. These, these are things that are helpful and good and supports the fall and heals the sick, releases the bound. Also, you see, like all good things, things that help. Maintain his faith to those sleep in the dust. So why would this be different from the first blessing? Why wouldn't these be things which are good loving kindnesses? That is to say, they're good on the surface. Well, let's see. Let's push just a little bit deeper. To say that he supports the fallen means some people fell, right? To say that he heals the sick means some people got sick. Least the bound means some people are bound. Hmm, who's behind that? Who's running that part of the scenario? Isn't God running everything? So if that's the case, this is a complex picture. He heals the sick. Okay, but he has a world in which people get sick, and then he heals them when they get sick. So if you're talking about the whole picture, the sickness has to be part of the picture also. That's not what you would find in the first blessing. Here you have sickness and health, falling and, and support, <coughs> being locked up and, and being released. So some of it is definitely what justice may require, strict judgment may require, because being falling or being sick or being locked up are negative features of the world. Even giving life means that you yourself don't have. You're not created as having the life in you. That means you're not self-sufficient. God is ultimately completely self-sufficient, isn't he? That which is not self-sufficient isn't like God in that respect. If God is perfection, then being dependent upon another is an imperfection. So that's an imperfection that he built into us. So maybe we are getting such a picture. Now, imperfections, like all things that aren't in themselves good, lead to good. But there are things that lead to good. Not that they are in themselves, themselves good. So, for example, um, we had uh, two days ago last week's parsha, and we uh, uh, the punishment of the snake. And one of the things in the punishment of the snake is that he'll be eating dirt. So the critic asks, "That's bad. Listen, there's lots of dirt. <laughs> He's never going to run out. There's lots of dirt almost everywhere. You know, his food is all around him." What's wrong with that? And the answer that's given is, well, it's contrasted with how God took care of the Jewish people in the wilderness for 40 years. Every morning they found manna, and every night it was all gone. They went to sleep with nothing. And the following morning, they woke up and found it again. And say the Talmudic rabbis, because he wants us to pray to him for what we need. And what he's saying to the snake is, I don't want to hear from you. I give it to you all free. I don't want to hear from you. I'm not connected to you anymore. Wanting to hear from us means he wants to, a relationship with us. So creating us dependent leads to what for us is a tremendous gift is continuous inter, 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 interaction. But it is an imperfection. So uh, the idea of creating us without life as part of our own nature and giving us um, and having to give us life means that we appreciate that we're dependent in that way. And this isn't, uh, this isn't metaphysical because the soul isn't like that. 
soul is something which by its very nature lives and could be destroyed, but by its nature lives. So it's not, not that he couldn't do that. Yeah, in the back. Um, why wasn't the snake able to be freed up? Why was the snake what? Why wasn't the snake able to be freed up? Oh, why well, was the snake able to do the tshuva? What kind of creature was the snake? Did the snake have free will? Didn't the snake have free will? It's a long and difficult subject. But I will tell you just, uh, uh, there's a halakhic answer to that question. Um, we have a rule in Jewish law that for a punishment to be mandatory, whether it be, let's say, execution or lashes, for a punishment to be mandatory, according to law, the criminal has to be warned before he commits the crime, and he has to respond and say, yes, I know, I know it's forbidden, and I know you're watching me, but I'm doing it anyway. Otherwise, law does not require punishment. There's one exception to that rule, and that is someone who tries to influence someone else to, to worship idols. There you can hide witnesses. And you say to the guy, gee, you, we were talking about something in the marketplace. Could you tell me over again what you, were what you were saying? And the witnesses are behind the screen. And he tells them over and says, I want you to come with me to worship idols. And he's murdered. He's, 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 he's executed. He's executed by the court. He doesn't get a second chance. For this crime, he doesn't get a, he doesn't get a warning. He doesn't get a second chance. It's, it's, it's this type of crime. That's what they were doing. He was telling you. He was trying to convince them to do something which directly rebels against what God wanted from them. That he's called a Macy's in Hebrew. It's called a Macy's. So that's where we were before, right? I, I said, does he have free will? And is he responsible for what he does? Okay, that's a good question, interesting question. That's where we were before. Now you asked a different question, and I answered that question. Okay, so now, so all of these things are Equivocal in that way. There's someone who's in trouble, and God is helping him in his trouble. So that is, is the element where you see the idea of, of, of just, justice and judgment entering into the picture indirectly, but it's, but it's in the picture, which wasn't so in the first blessing. Now, all of this, the way your translator writes it, is... Um, let me check here. Yeah. So here you have the same thing as I mentioned at the beginning of, the, uh, of this afternoon's year. The, in, on page uh, 99, it starts with, You are eternally mighty, my Lord, etc., etc. And it says you twice. That's true in the first line. Then you have a string of descriptions. And then it says, um, Keeps his faith to those who sleep in the dust. There's a switch to he. And then it immediately goes back to you. So obviously here, it's only this phrase that's meant to be in the third person. And if it's parallel to the first blessing, that means that only that phrase is meant to be the third person. Now, you can do the following, although I indicated another way of doing it. If you follow the translator in the first blessing, that... Um, Redeemer is a, uh, with a capital R referring to the Messiah. And here you're talking about keeping his faith to those asleep in the dust. Those are both events in the future. Everything else in the blessing is things that happen in the present. So the happening in the present, then the, the reference of you is appropriate because he is operating now. When you shift to a future event which hasn't taken place yet, then you can shift to he because it's something that's not present. So that would fit the meaning of the, of the, of the phrases uh, in an extremely, uh, extremely uh, uh, simple, direct way. Okay, so now the next words uh, I think are extremely important. Who is like unto you? O master of mighty deeds, who's comparable to you, O king, who causes death and restores life, etc. Now, we just had about six descriptions of the things that God does. We didn't say, who was like unto you? Who's comparable to you? Why not? 
All the things are good. All the things are helpful. Apparently, we're coming now to something which is over the top. Something that's over the top. Hmm. What would that be? How about who causes death? Death itself is the evil without the good. Yes, he causes life also afterwards, restores, restores life. Yeah, okay, fine. But unlike supporting the fallen and healing the sick and releasing the bound, they have a picture of someone who's in trouble and getting help. If you take causes life, human being is in and of himself dead and is receiving life. So the picture is a two-dimensional picture. But here when it says causes death, it's one-dimensional. Just causes death. Afterwards, he causes life also. Yes, life's awful also. Now here we're talking about someone who is master of mighty deeds. That means he controls them. They're not out of control. They're not because of his emotions. They're not because of other pressing. He has his plan, and he uses this in terms of his plan. Since death, in terms of the things in this blessing, the various things in this blessing which aren't in and of themselves good, death is the worst of them, here it stresses, don't think that this is in any way out of his control. This is his operation of making his plan come to fruition, just like all the, all the rest of them are. And the background to this, I'm just going to do this very briefly, but the background to this is, is as follows. Death, um, you understand that, according to almost everyone, uh, before eating from the tree of knowledge, there was no death. There wasn't supposed to be death. Why was death the consequence of eating from the tree of knowledge? So here's the scheme. Eating from the tree of knowledge caused a degradation of the entire creation including humanity and including the rest of the entire creation. It pulled the whole of the creation down a level on a scale of what you might call perfection. And you can picture the scale as follows. Human beings live in a, in a context of which there is both spirituality and physicality. And as they were created... Their spiritual level was one reality and their physical level was another reality. As a result of eating from the tree, their, their physical physicality in the first condition became the spirituality in the new condition. What was lowest before becomes highest in the new condition. Their spirituality is out of reach and a new physicality was pre created to be underneath, which didn't exist before. So the whole thing came down a level. Now, one of the consequences of that is the following. One aspect, one, one dimension of the project that we were put here to perform is this. There's a difference between the spiritual and the physical. The idea was to act in such a way that the spiritual expresses itself in the physical and thereby elevates purifies and even sanctifies the physical. So the physical becomes more spirit-like to the extent that instead of setting up a contrast with the spirit and setting up the competition which leads to free will, the spirit, the physical becomes in concert with the physical and even an aid to the, to the spiritual and even an aid to the spiritual so that they can be integrated into a single themed two-part entity. And that's the preparation of going into the world to come. So again, you have this, the soul and the body. The soul and the body are differently oriented. They present a conflict for the will. That's why you have free will, because you have a conflict. In that state, the body can't be grafted into the world to come, because then with the world to come, there's no opposition. Everything is harmonious. So there's a program of, of, of action of the soul and the body together under the direction of the soul, where the body becomes elevated, purified, spiritualized, sanctified, so that it now becomes harmoniously related to the soul. Then the soul and the body form a single 
integrated two-part entity, not a one-dimensional one, one entity, but a single integrated two-part entity, and that entity can go into the world to come. But one of the consequences of eating from the tree and bringing the whole world down is that the body has become so degraded that even if, together with the soul, it engages in activities which express spirituality, the body can't tolerate the transition to the position of complete harmony with the ultimate spirituality. If it were put under pressure to make that transition, it would simply cease to exist. Be like what happens to many people who make Aliyah to Israel, they lose their electrical appliances. They plug a 110 electrical appliance into the 220 electricity here, and it fries. That's what happens to your telephone, and that's what happens to the soul, if, there, if it were. So, death is an opportunity for this degraded body to deteriorate and to be remade in a superior fashion where it can relate to the soul, similarly to the way in which the soul and body of Adam and Chava were related to one another, so that what the soul has done in this world can then affect that body to elevate it, purify it, spiritualize it, sanctify it, and make it capable of being integrated into a single spiritual entity with the, uh, with the soul and go into the world to come. So death is the way you repair the damage that has happened in this world which would prevent the project from being completed. That's why death was a consequence of the... Uh, and that's why this thing, which is in and of itself bad, because God didn't decree death. God put death in as a possibility, as a repair for a, for a failure. But had they succeeded in the challenge in the Garden of Eden, no one would ever have died. There wouldn't have been any death. So it's to hear the, the blessing is saying, God, who's the master of this kind of uh, means, an event that's purely a means, he's the master of it, and therefore he controls it, and he uses it for that higher purpose, and he you know, applies it only to the minimum extent that it, that, uh, that it can be applied to achieve, the, to achieve the purpose. That's the outline. Am I interested in how do we bring the, what is the tumma inside the... Okay, Tuma is a big story, but I will just, I'll, I, in order to sort of orient you in the right direction, I'll point this out. Tuma is, what is Tuma? Tuma is a condition where a person is disqualified from having contact with holy things. I quoted that from my first wife, that she defined it as a mini kores, a miniature kores. Kores means being cut off from a god entirely. And she says, like a miniature, because sometimes you can't go into the temple or you can't eat consecrated foods. And sometimes it's from sacrifices. Sometimes you can't eat truma. The things that are holy, you have a restriction that you can't, you can't uh, be, have contact with them. So now, the, uh, the greater a thing is, the holier a thing is, the more important a thing is, the greater truma it's subject to. The greater Tumba, it's subject to. The thing which is, has the most Tumba is a dead Jewish body. Dead Jewish person's body. A dead horse also has Tumba. How come the Shagat says an Abba Tumba? It's just a bug, but it's... Like it's not a dead. bug. They're reptiles. They're not bugs. Oh, okay. Is, I mean, the word Sherat doesn't mean that, but eight shrubs are not, not bugs. Um... But uh, the things that, ha that have tumor, the holier the thing is, the more tumor it has. The, according to many, according, a body of a, of a non-Jew has tumor, but not the same kind of tumor as a, as a body of a Jew. So it's as if you have a, a, a zero point, and you have the capacity to move above and below. And this, they are, it's a mirror image. The extent to which you can move above is parallel to the extent to which you can move below. And if you are capable of greater elevation, you're also greater, uh, capable of greater degradation. The, the two are parallel to one another. So that, that's the starting point for, for Tuma. And the other thing, which Hirsch says, 
He'll work a little bit to work out the details, but he says it all has to do with death. All tomb has to do with death. Um, you know that if a person, if a man has a mission, there are millions of sperm there, right? A woman who has uh, who is bleeding is because the egg that could have been fertilized was lost. Um, the only example which is problematic is birth. A woman gives birth, and one explanation of that is, well, up until now she was two live, and now she's only one live. She's lost that life from her. It's not, it's not in her anymore. It's not part of her anymore. So she's lost that. So they all have to do with, with, uh, with death. And Rav Hirsch explains it as this way. I guess we might as well finish it today. <coughs> he explains it this way. Human being is created. This is similar to what I said the other day. It's very nice. Ozer. We said Ozer is more than Moshiach Magain. So Ozer means helper, and helper means you have a project. And you're working on the project. You just can't do it on your own. And I said, you weren't created to be drowning and God should save you. That's not why you were created. More so, you weren't created to be protected from things that don't ever reach you. That's not why you're in the world. You're in the world to do. Okay, you're in the world to do. Death is the absolute antithesis of that. Absolute antithesis. You lose entirely your ability to do. Going through something like death, going through something that's related to death, brings a person face to face with the ultimate limit on what he's able to do. It's like, if you're sensitive to it, it's like a soul shattering event. And that's why one ingredient in, in, in achieving pur purity is going to mikvah, which, according to many, is a, is, a, is a kind of imitation rebirth event. You immerse yourself in water, totally, and then you emerge. Not so different from being born. It's a kind of rebirth reenactment, uh, enactment. So that's, that's where the tomb is coming from. And uh, Okay, that, that's enough to say. You got a question? Okay, yeah, in the back. Um, the Shiva of Tumas Stanta, I, I heard, I don't remember where I heard it from, but, um, that, but the Torah, the Torah itself, like the scroll, you're not allowed to touch the, 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 the scroll itself because it has a certain amount of Tuma to it. Because no, chas v'shu. What it's, you, not like, it's not like the tumor that, that like we think of. It's like so no, you heard something like, else. So the, these are these are scrolls, uh, and particularly scrolls of of of, of the Megillos. They 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 made a tumor. Uh, the rabbis made a tumor out of it for the following reason: they were stored in walls and ships and what so on and so on, and there were rodents that uh, came and could come in, in contact with them and make them tummy, and then they were afraid they would touch tumor. So they wanted to make sure that they wouldn't touch. Truma, so they made a tumor for them, and therefore you can't stare at it anywhere place where there'll be food. But that, that has not, not, nothing to do with there. And, and uh, the, the kind of tumor that they have wouldn't make you tummy. It's much in, too inferior to make you, uh, to, to make you tummy. Can yeah. Ask you a question. How come reptiles then are capable of being an Abba tumor? How holy are they? Well, first of all, it's only eight species. It's not, it's not all of them. It's, it's all species. I don't know what, 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 what special... Uh, um, connection they have, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying to think now. I think uh, a dead horse also it doesn't have to be reptile. I think the the uh, Nevela is a Havatuma, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's just not 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 just yeah. When it's Mason Bob, you'll become Tommy through them. I think I think I think that's true. Okay, we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Oh, yeah. But uh,